Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I want to start by explaining what our role is, really, and how we carry that out. And basically, what we have to do in tourism is make sure that any developments that are suggested for the area contribute positively to Bournemouth's future as a world-class resort. The way we do that, again, is common to almost any developments that we might consider, and that's that we like to start always with an open mind about what the potential benefits can be. But then we need to conduct a fair but very rigorous analysis of exactly what's been suggested. At the end of it, hopefully come up with some reasonable, logical conclusions. And that's what we've done with this project. We've been working on it for over three years. We're conscious that the main things come down to what's the visitor effect going to be, the net visitor effect on this. What difference is that going to make to jobs and income in the area? And what are we doing to protect the very valuable assets that we know we've got in this area? And quite like Mike, actually, I do want to uh, try and tackle this by way of addressing some of the myths that have grown up inevitably when you have a major project. You get myths that develop, don't you? And it's in these six areas I want to look at the myths and try and dispel those this afternoon for you. The first of them concerns the consultation process. And you'd imagine that with over two years, and I get this level of need to say, well, after two years, they must have got that right, actually. The consultation must have been good. It must have dealt with all the issues. Well, unfortunately, it hasn't. And there have been deficiencies which the council and the tourism trade have articulated both to the developer and to the planning inspectorate about the way the process has been handled so far. The most fundamental of those problems is to do with the actual images. How can you decide whether something is going to look good if you can't see what it looks like? A basic, basic problem. And from the outset, it hasn't been right. Disappointingly, it's still not right now. If you go onto the website, you'll see images that make it look like you can't see the development. What it doesn't tell you when you look at those images on the Navitas Bay website is they should be four times as big. It does tell you somewhere else hidden away that that's the case, but it doesn't tell you when you look at the images. So you could look at that and think, what is the problem here? The other problem is the tourism industry has not been engaged. If you've got something that's going to actually affect the tourism industry, it's right and proper that the industry should be involved from the outset. And we had the rather bizarre situation in August 2012 that we had a senior representative, who should be unnamed, from Navitas Bay stand in a meeting with the tourism trade and our MPs there and tell us that we would be involved in the preparation and the development of the questionnaires that were going to be done with our visitors. The reason that was so bizarre is that in secret, at the same time, that very research had already been commissioned by Navitas Bay. It was going on during August. And so you had a commitment on the one hand they'd be involved in the, in the work, on the other hand it was being done in secret at that very time. And finally on consultation, the deficiencies about the information itself. Some information just simply not there, and other information coming in much too late for the industry to give a view on it. The second myth that I want to cross this afternoon, hopefully, is that the idea that this will create more visitors to the area, will be benefiting from this. Well, I'm pleased actually here that the information that the developer has about the loss of visitors, we confirmed that with our own research last year, that the figures the developer is saying about the effect, we agree with. And what that says is that there will be a loss during the construction phase of 32% of visitors to this area. One in three visitors will not want to come while this work is being carried out. And we agree with the developer's figures on that, it matches our own information. And then once the project's in place, 14%, one in seven people will not want to come to this area. Now you imagine what that does to industry and to business in the area. But interestingly, those figures are nearly double the national average for all these other destinations that you've heard mentioned by the last speaker, have, have, resort, have wind farms in those locations. They didn't suffer by anywhere near that percentage. The figures that they had were about 8% they were told would be the loss in business from their having wind farms there. We would nearly double that, and I'll explain why in a moment. The third myth is there'll be more jobs created because of the, the wind farm. Well, again, there will be some positive jobs. You've heard there, you heard recently there, that 140 jobs created in the area. What you didn't hear, unfortunately, is that those 140 jobs will go to one of the destinations that actually is the port, the host port for it. We've had a new one introduced today, which is Portsmouth, which was never in the consultation outside of the Dorset area, as you know. But what you also haven't heard is that of the 140 jobs, 
the industry information says that only 39% of them will stay within the area. The rest of them will be to suppliers of maintenance from across the country. So you're looking at only 60 jobs coming in. What you're going to lose, on the other hand, in Bournemouth alone, and this is not only for this is not taking into account the rest of Dorset, is two and a half, nearly two and a half thousand jobs. Our jobs locally in all levels and all types of business, including our retail sector, and it will particularly affect young people in the area, new jobs, and it will affect the unskilled, the very people who are the sorts of problems that you know, we know happen in some of the other destinations that have got wind farms already. The fourth myth quickly is that, and I hear this all the time, this is just, it's a good idea to have wind farms but nobody wants them in their backyard. So not in my backyard argument. Well, I can tell you that again, this is simply not true. If Bournemouth was only a destination, a tourist destination that relied on its local people, we couldn't support this sort of building. We couldn't support the infrastructure we have, the entertainment that we have, the gardens we have. We rely on being a national asset that's used by people from all over this country. And there on the screen you'll see some of the awards that we've picked up that recognise that Bournemouth is a national asset because people from all over this country want to come. And from further afield, we know that globally the area is recognised as having a special character. A very interesting on TripAdvisor, if you go and look on there what it says about this area, it says breathtaking views. It doesn't say good views or average views, it says breathtaking views is what you'll get in the area. It's exceptional and we need to make sure we keep that. The myth busting, the fifth one of my six, is that wind farms have worked elsewhere, so surely the same thing can happen here. And you've heard that this afternoon already. Well, I'll just be taking on a quick tour of the country, actually, of some of the places that were mentioned that have got wind farms close to, the, close to their, their coast. Rill is one of them, uh, one of the worst performing destinations in the whole country, unfortunately. But the point of the image is there, is that you can see that the sort of place that it's got, it's offering, is going to appeal to very different people. I lived in Manchester up to the age of 18. I can tell you I used to love to go to North Wales, but it wasn't for the views. It wasn't for the views out to sea. It was because of the built attractions on land. The same in Blackpool. What, the reason we would go to Blackpool is because of the amusement arcade to Pleasure Beach. It was fantastic fun. We never stood on the seafront and looked out to sea to say, what an amazing view. It didn't happen. Go around the coast to Great Yarmouth, exactly the same scenario. The reasons why people go from the East Midlands to Great Yarmouth, and I know all these resorts very, very well, is because of the built attractions, because of the pleasure beaches, because of the amusement arcades. The wind farm is actually, I think, quite an asset. It's another built attraction that we put something there that wasn't there before, but it's not the same as the reason why people would come to Bournemouth. The same for Plankton. And interestingly, these destinations I've mentioned there, were also mentioned, it's not just me saying it, they were mentioned in a government report last summer from the Centre for Social Justice that said all those destinations I've just featured were actually poverty attracting more poverty in those destinations. And that same report picked out Bournemouth in the second paragraph of the introduction to say, here is a resort that's flourishing. Okay, very, very different. So, as I won't go on that anymore, you can see the difference between what we're talking about here and some of those other destinations. And the idea that, that actually they're all the same simply isn't true. The other difference is that end destinations are quite different to the wind farms you'll see en route to where you're going. And probably the best example I can give you of that is if you look at the Lake District, and I've been up there recently, as you, many of you will have done, you see wind farms en route, don't you? Uh, this is something Harris on the left-hand side, right in the heart of the, uh, the Lake District. But what you don't see is when you go to Windermere, you will not see a single turbine. Why? Because they're very careful that in the special areas, they keep them looking special. And so you don't get them in, a, in inappropriate places. So Bournemouth, I would argue, is very special and needs to be looked at on its individual strengths and its merits. But the final one is this idea that, that tourism and wind energy have to be opposing. They simply don't. Some of those examples of places like Great Yarmouth, I think that the wind energy is helping because of the nature of the people who go to that, that location. It's actually a benefit. And also, I'm pleased to say that I believe, personally, it's definitely possible to have the benefits of wind energy without damaging tourism if it's done properly. And I just want to finally uh, finish with some of this example of uh, the Northern European wind farms. You'll see most of them, and that's the pink areas that are on there, most of them are well outside the inshore limit of 12 nautical miles. 
Okay, and they're developed for a reason. Now, if you look at ours, it's actually inside that that offshore limit. It's actually an inshore wind farm, if you like. But just taking you to the example in Europe, I want to just finish with this case study, and it's the Princess Amalia wind farm, which is off the north coast of Holland. And you'll see there that it's got an appeal, it's got an interest with a national park in that area on the coast because of its environmental value. And the environmental value was such that they made absolutely certain with seven years of planning to get that right, seven years of planning with the developer and the local authorities to get it right. They made sure that it was off, offshore, it wasn't going to be visible, they had monitoring of all the environment before, during and after the project. And the net result of that is that you got a win-win. You got something that definitely didn't damage the environment, that actually made sure that the development was out of sight for Dutch holiday makers, so it didn't spoil their experience on the beach or when they're in the, in the national park. And those wind turbines were 25 kilometers offshore. There were also wind turbines that are half the height of the ones that have been suggested for the Navitas Bay project. So you can see it can work. And the beauty of it is that the developer was particularly proud of that. And it's the same developer that we have developing the, web, the Navitas Bay. It's an eco now twinned with EDF. So that developer, we had every confidence in the outset, would want to have those same standards applied to this, this particular development. Unfortunately, it's definitely not materialized in that way. So since it's clearly possible to have the benefits of wind energy, we've seen it there at Princess of Lyon Holland with the same developer applying proper environmental standards, it's simply unnecessary to contemplate the irresponsible action of having solving one environmental problem about renewables by creating another environmental problem in terms of the visual immunity of, of an area and the economic consequences of that. So in summary, what we've got here is an exercise of unfortunately poor consultation when the industry and the council and the tourism business wanted to participate. It's not happened. We've got significant visitor economy damage to the area that will devastate the businesses in this area, unfortunately. We've got harm to a national and international global asset that's being suggested, which can't be right. And we've got, what we should have is responsible development. There's a missed opportunity to have a responsible development that can work for every interest and not double standards. Thank you.